you probably don't get the right data. It's the same thing in biology. You know, we want to study cells. So what do we do? We freeze them with liquid nitrogen. And then we shear them open. Now, they're not alive anymore, you know. <laughs> and then we look with an electron microscope. And say, oh, wow, you know, DNA is a big mess in there. <laughs> We're probably not getting the right data. And so, why is it that, I just want to make a point, that this excess mass is because it's actually in the mainstream theory, it's just they don't know about it. And the reason why is because when they found two protons, they said, oh my God, protons are positively charged. So they should repel each other inside the nuclei, like two magnets would repel each other if they have the same charge, right? You're all following this. Well, when they found this, they said, oh, you know, Gravity couldn't squeeze them that hard. There must be some unknown force. And the next thing they did is they invented a new force almost a hundred years ago. They called it the strong force. Very convenient. And then they put it in there and they made it exactly the strength it needed to do to push the protons together. Ha! Huh. I call that physics as you go. <laughs> they did the same thing with the universe they found the equation only predicts 4% of the universe missing 96% of the universe instead of revising the equation they said oh we'll invent dark matter and dark energy throw it in there in the right percentage look the equation works must be there <laughs> physics as you go right so then you know, when they invented this strong force, then the next thing you know is they can't reconcile the strong force with gravity. They can't put the two together. Right? So now they have this big dilemma, and now they keep adding dimensions to try to make it work. You know? It ain't gonna work, because the strong force does not exist. It's a figment of our imagination. It's gravity acting at the atomic level. You're dealing with mini black holes. That's why the electron spins at near the speed of light. Right? So, if you take two of these protons, little black hole protons, and you calculate their strength, I'm, not, I'm going to spare you the equations. Um, although you could easily follow them, because they're simple. Um, the... <laughs> The uh, force between two black hole protons is very large, so it can overcome the repulsion. But then you calculate how fast two protons like that with that force would rotate around each other. And you find that, um, you know, they rotate at very high speed, 10 to the 32 centimeters per second square, very rapidly. And then you calculate... That was their acceleration. You calculate their velocity, and V turns out to equal 2.9 multiplied by 10 to 10 centimeters per second. Anybody recognize that number? Very good. The speed of light. V equals C. So now, these little protons at the center of the atom are not only infinitely dense, but they're spinning at near the speed of light. They're spinning at very high velocity, near the speed of light. So you know all these masters that walked around saying, you are light? They meant it. Can you like, visualize yourself? Can you... Can you sense yourself? Can you sense your atoms as mini black holes spinning near the speed of light? This is how dynamic you are. This is how energetic you are. 
It's an amazing thing. You're transferring information to the universe and back at the speed of light. You're flickering. Really, really quickly. Push. The vacuum. To the vacuum, back out. To the vacuum, back out. To the vacuum, back out. So, who are you when you're the vacuum? Have you explored your vacuum self? <laughs> you know, please don't talk to your shrink about this because it <laughs> might put you some nasty drugs, you know. <laughs> Bro, you're bipolar. <laughs> yes, I am. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Half the time, I'm the vacuum. <laughs> I don't think they have any drugs to stop that one. <laughs> so, um, you know, I can skip some of that, but I just wanted to say, you know, you're flickering, you're informing the vacuum, flickering in and out of it very, very quickly. Everywhere is happening like this, you know. It's uh, <laughs> my four-year-old actually talked to me about that once. But, um, you know, it's... Uh, it's, it's really a remarkable thing and it's really important to become aware of this interaction. And when it's happening, you start to realize that maybe linear motion is not quite what we think it is. And what I mean by that is that if you try, if we live in a fractal universe of infinite division from infinitely big to infinitely small, then movement from point A to point B is quite different than what we assume it is. Okay? You can start to look at your hand and say, okay, my hand is going from point A to point B. And I'm going to calculate how fast it did that. Well, you know, if you close the box around your hand, then you can do it. But if you realize that it's all embedded to infinity, then you'd say, well, m while my hand was going from A to B, the earth was rotating. So I got to add that speed. And then while that was happening, the earth was rotating. Then the sun, it was rotating around the sun. So I got to add that speed. And then as it rotated around the sun, the sun was moving through the galaxy. So I got to add that speed. So you know, your hand is now moving at millions of miles per second, you know. And then like... You know, you keep adding because the this galaxy is in a supercluster, which is in a super in, in in a cluster, which is in a supercluster, and so on. In a universe, in a multiverse. Next thing you know, your hands going at the speed of light. <laughs> yeah. So how do you define movement? You realize that your hand is not moving linearly from A to B. That's the chopper that likes to follow me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> your hand is appearing, disappearing, appearing, disappearing, undoing itself, redoing itself, undoing itself, redoing itself, every time going to infinity and back. Being in form of, must, of where it must reappear. Just like a movie, which is a bunch of frames, but if you move the frames fast enough, they appear to be smooth. And if you realize that, if you realize that you're interacting with the vacuum this way, and you're good at manipulating the vacuum, what I call ma vacuum engineers, masters, you might be able to get your hand to disappear here and reappear over there. And skip all the points in between. Now, if you did that, you want to make sure you bought your body with it. Because it <laughs> could be uncomfortable on this end with the re missing the rest of your body. So, this leads, this understanding, this technology, this capacity to interact with the vacuum, both in your own being, but very specifically in laboratory, leads to technology that will blow your mind. Leads to technology that not only brings us to a capacity of abundance of energy, infinite amount of energy, space drive and so on, but to actually 
transfer the information from one end of the galaxy to the other end of the galaxy without having to go through all the points in between. And I assure you, although that might sound like far in the future, all this is just around the corner. Now, you know, I wanted to show... Well, you know, when you make the calculation, you get the magnetic moment of the atom, and you get all the things you would expect in the atom. But I wanted to say a few things on ancient civilization, because when I did this research, I was studying in parallel a lot of ancient civilizations. And the reason was, is that I realized that if this vacuum structure is really there, if the vacuum is polarized, if it's not just a random mess, as in defining quantum theory currently, but actually is the source of the organization of everything, then it must have geometry. It must have a fundamental structure, and we need to understand what that structure is. And as I studied ancient civilization, these guys kept on pointing to very fundamental geometries. And they all said, this is the geometry of creation, it's everywhere, this is how creation occurs. And you can find it in almost every ancient civilization around the world. And then they built very, well, they built. Let's use that loosely. They might have got some help. You know, and uh, very specific geometries all around the world with very specific intense, you know, uh, focus on very, you know, important texts of, of, uh, that describe this geometry, this fundamental geometry of the vacuum. And I spent many, many years studying them and I realized that there was a code that was left here by many ancient civilization. And you know, I really don't have time in such a short lecture. Most people that have been to my lectures, they're usually 10 hours long. To actually get into that part of, of the knowledge. But it is evident when you do the research and you can get my DVD set and it has like eight hours of this information. You can get it at the table. You can pre-order it at the table. And um, I discuss all this because when you look in all these ancient texts, in all these ancient civilization, it talked about this geometry and gave us all the mathematics, all the equation to solve it. And even gave us some technical knowledge how to build it in laboratory. And do I think that ancient people came out just out of osmosis? Absolutely not. Evidence support very widely that there was some um, advanced civilization around here that were attempting to give us some knowledge about these things. You know? Some of those guys... This is in Russia. They just found these skulls not so long ago. And that the geometry was fundamentally embedded in many different ways. You know, this is actually on a pillar in Egypt. It's not etched. It's not carved. It's somehow burned into the atomic structure of the granite pillar in Egypt, at the Ozarian Temple. Um, then you go to China. You know, the Fu Dog is the guardian of the knowledge. He guards the knowledge under his paw. And then you look under the paw, and sure enough, you get the same geometry. And this geometry that I'm talking about is very fundamental and it is a geometry extrapolated from, uh, from writing concepts of the structure of space-time that demanded a fundamental 
a geometry that could produce all of the rest of the geometry we see in our universe, in our uh, biology, and in our, uh, in our organization of uh, the universe. And it's based on tetrahedrons. It's a 64 tetrahedron grid. We have talks coming up in, for the next three weeks, so please come to our talks. There you go. Thank so, you. Watch this. Come back in half an hour. Thank you again for saying that was great.